This is my first time up here. You don't really know me. So let me tell you something about myself. I'm very sophisticated. <laughs> I'm very clever. I'm creative. I'm charming. I'm really funny. I'm very, I'm very grounded in my spirituality. I'm fully integrated through years of therapy. I'm a wonderful friend. I'm a loving family relative and essentially the most amazing, blessed, and gifted human being you're going to meet this week. <laughs> Something else. I'm a total narcissist. <laughs> I'm completely needy, and I'm always ready to be the center of attention. My spiritual practice is undisciplined and erratic. I'm essentially lazy. I'm driven by the basest impulses, and I'm given to prevarication and exaggeration. I live in a state of denial and self-centeredness. I'm shallow and I'm superficial, and I'm truly eager to have someone, anyone, step up and take care of me. So now you know me. No, you don't. But like you, I am a broken vessel. And I have to work very intentionally to embrace that brokenness, to be who I am meant to be. Before I go any further, I want to share something with you about, about, about me that really is authentically true. It has to do with my microtheology, which is a great word. I heard it last year used by a weighty Quaker friend. Quakers call people who are smart and can think in depth weighty. doesn't mean they're heavyweight. You know. But he used the word microtheology to mean that every, to, to remind me that every one of us has a very unique understanding of and relationship with divinity our concept of God, and our own divinity. And it's completely unique. We could be in a little tiny community that everyone goes to the same church and has the same pastor, and our parents went to that church and learned from that pa pa uh, pastor's predecessor. But each one of us has a unique microtheology. My microtheology is that I believe that our, at our most integral level, we are intimately and completely connected to that which is eternal, infinite, and universal. We belong here. As physicists have it, every molecule is exactly where it needs to be. And that's probably the only time you'll hear me refer to science in our entire relationship. Okay. If we do indeed belong here, I like to think that we are loved unconditionally by the universe, by spirit, by God, by one another, which of course are all the same thing to me in my Sufi-influenced, Talmud-informed interpretations of the teachings of Jesus of Nazareth, which are confirmed by Buddhist teachings and Vedic teachings. It's all right there. Jesus, whom I tend to refer to by his given name, Rabbi Joshua ben Joseph of Nazareth, tells this story. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One is a hotshot Pharisee, the kind of people, guy that controls things, guy in charge, and the other a lowly tax collector. Think bookie. Okay. The Pharisee stands by himself and praise God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, like criminals or punks, the cast of Real Housewives of New Jersey, even like this tax collector schmuck over here. I fast twice a week and I give a tenth of everything I own. But the tax collector stands at a distance and he can't even look up to heaven. But he beats his breast and he says, God have mercy on me, I'm a worthless piece of trash. Most often this story is used to discuss and point out the difference between pride and penitence, between arrogance and humility. But I heard the wonderful Sarah Miles, and if you don't know who she is, look her up, give a sermon in which she pointed that both of these men are full of baloney, and that at one point in each of our lives, we are each both of those men. Because self-grandiosity and self-deprecation are two sides of the same coin. And they are both inaccurate, unfair, and misleading portrayals of who we truly are. No wonder it's hard for the, whole, the wholeness in us to embrace the broken aspects of our lives. We're fed this kind of duality constantly by our culture, by entertainment, by our society, by our family, and by our own egos. But there's something wonderful that I believe is true. We are all loved, all completely interconnected, despite the fact that we are all broken, all flawed, all incomplete in our perfection, in our completeness. Does that sound confusing and contrary? Good, because it is. There's some tension there, and that's the gift we've been given. In the Talmud, uh, Sanhedrin 38a, it tells us to carry two pieces of paper, one in each pocket. 
One says, for me, the entire world was created. The other says the words of Abraham Avenu, I am but dust and ashes. Our teacher, Judo Krishnamurti, speaks of our souls each being of the same paper, but what makes us unique are the creases that are left in that paper from life folding it and unfolding it and crumpling it and uncrumpling it, the experiences of the learned journey of life. Right? We're all of divine creative energy, all connected, all of the same paper. But look at us, what do we do? We try to hide our brokenness. We try to fix it. We try to compensate for it. Everything, in fact, except integrate, inhabit, and embrace it. There are teachings in every tradition about brokenness, suffering, and loss. And the Beatitudes, and for me that's the most important teaching of Jesus, the most subversive core of Jesus' teachings, it's radical and it's paradigm destroying. We learn, blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted. And this is paraphrased by the wonderful Eugene Peterson. He says, you're blessed when you feel you've lost what is most dear to you. Only then can you be embraced by the one who is most dear to you. Given the context of this version of Matthew, okay, Matthew uh, undoubtedly spoke Aramaic. And Aramaic, like Arabic and Hebrew, is meant to be interpreted on multiple levels. Every word has multiple meanings, so every sentence has multiple meanings. And it's incumbent upon the listener to interpret what's being said. And given the previous beatitude, which is essentially about how the spiritually disenfranchised, those of us who are broken toys, which is all of us, are the ones who will gain the kingdom, which is a metaphor for coming awake and being enlightened and being reconnected to our own divinity. So this teaching has multiple levels of meaning and is probably as much about the world around us as it is about our own personal sense of grief and loss. Because beyond those who grieve or other loss, those who mourn has also been understood to mean those who are frustrated about and in despair in the condition of the world. Those of us who see the values and priorities being lived out in society, and we know that these are not what we know to be the ethical values of compassion, justice, righteousness, and love. Those who are in that state of dismay will be comforted. And in my opinion, that just may mean knowing that we ourselves are on the path as best we can to truth and love and justice. There's a great, the Bhagavad Gita, I don't know if you know this great Hindu text, it opens with a great scene before a battle, and the main character, Arjuna, is a warrior, and he's in his chariot. And his whole spiritual brokenness that is being portrayed there reflects that second beatitude. He says to Krishna, who's disguised as his charioteer, my heart is breaking, his sorrow is paralyzing him, and he falls to the bottom of his chariot in despair and utter emotional pain. He turns to Krishna for comfort. His sorrow is a spiritual necessity. I mean, of course, the battle is really one for the soul. It's a great metaphor. But there's tremendous spiritual sorrow in self-honesty and confession. It's deep, hard work, and we're called to do it. Arjuna has spiritual wisdom only because of his confession and in his sorrow at failing to be whom he should be. Happy are those whose self-honesty brings sorrow because that sorrow produces spiritual growth and wisdom, and they will be comforted. Blessed are those whose compassion and sorrow over the suffering of others leads them to share that suffering, for they will both bring comfort and be comforted. In the commentary on the Bhagavad Gita, Swami uh, Bhaktivedanta comments, and blessed is the one who is kind and soft-hearted, who devotes his life to the Lord. Such a one is fit to receive self-knowledge. So let me turn away from Hinduism and to Judaism. David, the sweet singer of Israel, he was a very complex guy. Psalm 51 is a very powerful poem, especially when we realize that it was, and as we're reading it, that David is said to have composed it after he sent Bathsheba's husband off to die in battle so he could have Bathsheba for himself. There's a passage in that psalm that reads, My sacrifice, O God, is a broken heart. A broken and contrite spirit, you will not despise, O God. The Hebrew word that's used here for contrite does not mean humble. It means crushed to powder. Isn't that amazing? In Hebrew, the scripture reads, Zabak Elohim, Shabar, Ruach, Shabar, 
the Kaleb Elohim Bazaar. It can be translated as sacrifice to God is the birthing of the spirit. It can also be translated as sacrifice to God is the quenching of anger. And here again is Eugene Peterson paraphrasing this. I learned God worship when my pride was shattered. Heart shattered lives, ready for love, don't for a moment escape God's notice. We suffer. Our spirits get crushed with disappointment and doubt. We see ourselves as broken. But we are always lovingly connected and poised for healing, even when we simply can't believe that. No doubt is too great. No faith is too small. Another psalm by David, written um, after he pretended to be insane to get rid of somebody. Like I said, a complex guy, right? From Psalm 34, he says, The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. And this is this wonderful theme that keeps coming up in Buddhist and Judeo-Christian texts of healing, healing of the spirit. In Hebrew, there's this wonderful word, uh, tikkun, which means to mend, to heal, to transform, which is also the basic theme of Islam. I mean, the very name Islam comes from salam, which means to be intact and to be whole and to be sound and to be complete. The purpose of Islam is to heal the brokenness in our relationship to God as well as with our fellow human beings and all of creation. Indeed, the purpose of religion or any belief system in my mind is to provide identity, to bring integration, mending, healing, and transformation. It is a path that is always readily available to us. It enables, up to, it enables us to transform ourselves from mere self-existence to pro-existence from merely living for ourselves to living for others, because that's living for God. The golden rule is universal, and it is the sole truth. A friend of mine was teaching a graduate-level course on the Holocaust, and one of the graduate students came to him and said, he asked him, you know, what's the great moral takeaway from this tragic, horrific event? My friend thought for a moment, and he said, when you're going home tonight and you stop at a 7-Eleven, how are you going to treat the person behind the counter? Is it any wonder that we see ourselves as broken? We live in a broken world, broken relations, broken hearts, broken trusts and treaties, broken homes, broken buildings and communities. And I'm not speaking here of the great impermanence that we all know underlies everything, that great organic beauty that of what's decomposing and going away. I'm talking about the corruption of violence. We see a world filled with images of, of the glorification of violence. We live in a society that is, in essence, an armed camp. We're inundated with cage fighters, professional wrestling, humans pitting animals against one another, zombies, vampires, uh, murder, desensitizing video games, torture. All these divine, the divine values of compassion and love turned completely upside down, and it's given to us as entertainment. And we wonder why we're broken. But we have all the tools we need to deal with this. We have a wonderful abundance of gifts in our toolkit. We are loved. We are connected. We belong. We have the ability to practice empathy and compassion. We all have everything we need to bring true healing, true tikkun, true salam, to heal our brokenness and the brokenness of those we encounter and of the world we live in and the blessed planet upon which we walk. We're broken. We are whole. We are complete and we are perfect. We are home. May we remember that our true existence and our best security are embedded within us more deeply than suffering or brokenness can ever reach. May it be so. Amen.